Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope you are doing all right. So we are now beginning to the new chapter. So, so far, we have already learned about three basic principles, kinematics, dynamics, and the conservation principles. And we use those in the rotational motion of object. Now, in this chapter, we're going to be focusing on using those in fluids. So, just like any other, uh, you know, new topics, we're going to start by talking about the definition first, and then we're going to use dynamics, kinematics, and so on and also the conservation principle, but all those three not going to be in today's class. Today we'll mostly focus on, uh, let's see, uh, dynamics, more, uh, let's say, yes, without any acceleration. So equilibrium condition, fluids in equilibrium, okay? So, so fluid, Okay, some objects are fluid, some are solid. What's the difference? So to find the difference, we have to go all the way to the atomic or molecular level, okay? So all materials are made up of atoms. And if those atoms, and those atoms are basically, you know, welding with each other, uh, bonded with each other, like a spring-like bond. We talked about that several times in this class. So in case of solid, what happens is that bond, those stream, string, uh, not string, but the springs, they are stiff, large spring constant, let's say relatively, so that they cannot move much. So they can vibrate a little bit, but cannot move much. So that's why they keep their own shape, solid, keep their own shape because of that strong bonds with the neighbors, okay? But in case of liquid and the gases, what happens is the bond is not as strong. For the case of liquid and gas, what's the difference then? Yes, it's still bonding force. So bond force, they are not as strong as the, you know, they have for the solid, but they are still large enough so that these molecules cannot just move around freely. They can slide around, but cannot move uh, freely. But in case of gas, what happens? They can move uh, freely, okay? So because of that, what happens is liquid has their own, you know, they don't have their own shape. So whatever container we put in, it takes their shape. On the other hand, yes, gas also takes the shape, but what happens is they don't even have a fixed volume because they just expand, they can fly, gas molecules can fly and fill the space, okay? So that's the main difference basically, okay? So since the atoms are spread or molecules, I should say, for the gases, their spread, what happens is if we apply force or pressure, they can come close together. So that means they don't have fixed volume. On the other hand, uh, for the liquid, they have fixed volume because there isn't much room for compressing, okay? So that's the main difference between fluid and the gas. Okay, with that said, uh, so since the bonds are not that strong, they can flow, and that's why they are called fluid. So now, what are the some basic properties of these matters? One is density. So density, we use this word in our daily life, uh, but uh, when we define density, how do we define? So density is mass divided by volume, okay? 
So it is denoted by the symbol called rho, it's not P, okay? And I write something like that. And what happens is it's a mass divided by volume. So what happens is let's say if we have similar container or basically same container, but one is filled with water and another one is filled with sand, what happens? See, volume of them are same, but the sand is heavier. That means the density of the sand is larger than the density of water, okay? So it's not the shape and size. Uh, it's both mass and the volume that determines the density, okay? And uh, the density is basic property of material, okay? It's like a kind of fingerprint. So just like a fingerprint, differentiate one people from another. Similarly, value of per, per, the, the value of density differentiate one object from another object, okay? One kind of matter has one density. For example, iron has one density, no matter what kind of things we made up of iron, right? Uh, so it does not matter. Iron has a fixed density. So once we discover new material and find its density, we can compare to the table of densities of the materials we already know. If it matches with them, then that means your new thing is not really new thing. But if it does not matches with any other thing, then that, I mean, any density of any other materials that we have already discovered, then that's gonna be new. For example, if you found shiny white object and you found the density by measuring mass, total mass and the volume it occupies and finding the ratio, you found the density and turns out, you know, it is, uh, so the density matches with the density of, uh, let's say, silver. So you discovered, you, you found silver. You did not discover silver, but you found silver, which is more valuable than, uh, let's say, iron or steel, right? So anyway, so that's what the density is. So here is a question for you about the density. Okay. Uh, here are two objects, object number A and object number B, and density is defined by this. And by the way, this is the unit of density. Mass is kilogram, unit of mass is kilogram, and volume being the product of three side length, okay? So for example, here it says cube. That means it has three side lengths, and all of them have equal length, right? So this one has L and this thing has two times L. So that's what it is saying. And you are also given information about mass. So it's just a matter of finding density of object one, A I should say, and object B, and then you compare them, right? So I will open the pool and let you work on this. So go ahead. And you have a minute and 30 seconds to answer this question. Thirty more seconds. Okay. 
and five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. Okay, let's see what we got here. We have A and C competing, and there is some B as well. So I don't know the answer. I have to do some work. Okay. Uh, so here, density of A, density is mass divided by volume. So A has mass M, so I'll just use that M. And then volume of A, so side length is L, 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 so L times L times L is L cubed, right? So that's the density of A. Now let's try to find density of A, right? density of A, B, and then compare with A. So in this case, mass is four times M, four times larger mass, about a volume. So 2L times 2L times 2L, so 2L cubed. So this is 4M, and then 2L times 2L times 2L, that's what 2L cubed means means 8L cubed. So we see here, this is 4, this is 8, so 8 is 2 times more than 8, sorry, 4. So this is half, and this is mass over length cubed, which is same as the density of A, so that means half of density A. So density of B is half of density of A. That means A has double the density of B. So A has more density. Okay? So A, in this case, is correct answer. So they have different density we learn, and we learn how to calculate density and compare. When you have given mass and the let's say some sort of dimension of object that you can use to calculate the volume. So now there is another cons question. Are they made up of same material? So I'm making clicker question so that everyone can participate. So let's say yes, B, no, C cannot be answered. by just knowing the density. So now I'm opening the poll and you have 30 seconds to answer this question. So I'm pulling on this one here. Five more seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. And let's see what we got here. So mostly B, but there are A and C as well. So they have different density, it means they are made up of two different materials, okay? Uh, so I think B is a uh, best choice here. Different density means they are made up of different materials. Remember, density is like a fingerprint. Okay. So now moving on, let's talk a little bit more about density. I talked most of these, but here I like to focus on these numbers here. These are the materials we're gonna be often talking about when we talk about density. So one is density of water, nice number, 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter. And density of blood, slightly more than density of water, makes sense because blood has some minerals and proteins. Uh, so minerals, they have 
with higher density than the water. So because of that, what happens is on average, the density becomes larger for the blood. Not that much large, just by a little bit more. Okay. And air, on the other hand, has a very small density compared to the water. See, water has nearly a thousand times more density than the density of water. Sorry, air. Hmm. Uh, so that means compared to the water, air has very small density. So that's why we cannot actually float on the air without taking help from something like a parachute or something like that, okay? But in the water, if we practice, we can float, right? Okay, and there is another object or matter, mercury. So it is, it exists in fluid form, okay? Uh, it is liquid and uh, it has the largest density among any liquid exist in the nature, which is 13,600 kilogram. So it has a density 13.6 times more than the density of water, okay? Nearly 14 times more. And this comparison basically brings the new word, for example, sometimes density is written as the ratio of the density of object with respect to density of water. And when we do that, that quantity is called specific gravity. So gravity does not have anything to do with the specific gravity or gravity, but it is there, okay? Uh, so, how do we define it? It is the ratio of the density of object with respect to the density of water. So density of water is 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter, nice number. And even nicer and easier number if we were to write that in gram, gram per cubic centimeter. See, this is also SI unit, but this is kind of smaller uh, unit than kilogram and meter. Okay, so in one kilogram, there are 1,000 grams and there are 100 centimeters in one meter, right? And similarly, one kilogram, 1,000 grams. So if we were to use this conversion factor into this, we can get this number. See, there is the one. So one, when you multiply something by one, it does not change the value. If we divide something by one, it does not change the value. So in that case, it's gonna just simply eliminate the unit. So specific gravity is unitless quantity and it represents the density of object without unit. But if we want density from the specific gravity, what you need to do is you need to multiply that by density of water. Just you can see that by just rearranging this definition of specific gravity. Okay. So back in the days, we used to have tables of the material, you know, all these, uh, uh, let's say, constants. So if you keep writing everything, then it occupies more space. So to simplify those things, they use this specific gravity instead of a density. So I'll be using just density, but sometimes while reading or anything like that, if you encounter word specific gravity, uh, that's what it means. Now you know it. Okay. So that's about density, folks. So now let's move on and let's define another term uh, called pressure. Of course, we know pressure, but if someone asks you to write the difference between pressure and force, maybe we may have to think or we may get confused or we may just uh, say wrong thing, right? So what is pressure and how does it arise? So if material or matter exert force on any surface, that force divided by the area of that surface is called pressure. And in case of liquid and gas, what happens is these molecules are constantly hitting the surface and bouncing back, 
heating surface, what surface of the container they are in, okay? And uh, I have tried to make this animation, see how the gas molecules, they are bouncing around when they are inside the closed container, okay? So that basically when they collide, they change the velocity. So change in velocity times mass gives us change in momentum and rate of change of momentum is force or mass times acceleration is force. So these objects are, or these tiny molecules are exerting uh, force on the area. So when we take account of that force over the area which it is acting, we can say, okay, that's the average pressure acting. So why word average here? Because for example, we may be pushing a part of the object, but that object may have larger area. So what happens is the, the point or the you know place where we are directly pushing, it experiences a little bit more force than the other part of the object. So that's why if we focus on pressure at particular points on the object, the pressure is gonna be different at different places when you are applying force. So that's why we like to talk in terms of average pressure on whole object in that sense, okay? So we had a cold snap and snow, right? And probably many of you saw this low pressure gauge come in in your car's dashboard. So what happened there? Temperature decreased. So when temperature decreases, pressure decreases, we'll write and talk about that equation in next class. But for now, how do we describe that? So for example, what happens is it turns out these molecules move faster when temperature is higher. So they are bouncing quite often and velocity large, so change in velocity large could be large. So that's gonna give us large uh, force and hence the large pressure. But what happens? Once the temperature decreases, they are not as active. They are not moving as fast. And because of that, they are not heating the wall as enough, you know, like uh, not as many often, I should say. And because of that, what happens now, the force, you know, the force and the average pressure becomes smaller. So now how do you increase that? Yes, one way sometimes you may have noticed in the morning that the gaze is showing, okay, low pressure and you drop for, you know, like let's say miles and temperature went up. And in that case, what happens? The, the low pressure sign may just give, go away. So what happened there? Temperature increased back and pressure increased. But other times, if temperature does not increase back to the, you know, the level that's needed for the that pressure, then in that case, we have to put more air. So that means we are increasing the number of these molecules, air molecules inside the tire. So now, rather than just, let's say, one billion molecules pushing on the tire wall, now there are more than one billion because we added more. And because of that, the total force becomes larger and the average pressure also becomes larger. So that's how the pressure increases on the tire. Okay, so that was about the pressure, area dependence and temperature dependence and number of the molecule dependence. We'll write equation about them in next class. So now unit of pressure can be written from the this definition, right? That's what we do. So Newton is the unit of force and unit of area. Area being the product of two sides. It's a meter times meter, so meter squared. So that's why this is that. And in honor of a scientist, it's also called Pascal. We'll talk about Pascal's principle pretty soon, okay? So now, there are other units, for example, when we look at the tire, the unit of the pressure on the tire, that 
you know, post it on the door side of the door, right? Okay, that's the pressure you want in your tire. That is written in PSI, which is means pound per square inch. So these are not SI unit, okay? They are also called British unit or English unit, okay? Uh, but uh, in science, we use SI unit. But in daily life, uh, we, we, we may use this. For example, when we go buy, let's say, package of apple, we see it's written that many pounds rather than kilogram over here in US, right? So anyway, so that's why you see that PSI written, so pounds per square inch. Pound is unit of force, and inch is unit of length. So square means area, so there is area, that's the unit of area, this is the unit of force. So basically it's the same thing, but in different units. So when unit changes, what happens? The number also changes. Now, what is this? This is the atmospheric pressure. So we are surrounded by gas molecules, right? And these molecules are bouncing around and they give the pressure, okay? And uh, that pressure at the sea level is this much. We are being a mile high city, a mile higher from the sea level. We have lower pressure, so pressure decreases with height as well. But in general, when we talk about pressure, this is called standard, you know, pressure at a standard temperature and pressure, you know, like this is the standard pressure. And this pressure is near the sea level, okay, called atmospheric pressure. So depending on what you unit, uh, you know, you're looking at, uh, that may be, you know, the number may be different. For example, here, this looks like very large number, right? 100,000, 10 to the power of five means when w one with five zeros. Uh, so that means uh, that is 100,000 Newton over a square meter. Usual hour, you know, desk used by one person for the study or so on. That is about one square meter. So that experience, how much force because of this atmospheric molecules, atmosphere, you know, this gas molecule, air molecules, nearly 100,000 Newton. And one Newton is about the weight of one small apple. So that means it's like uh, there are 1,000 apples on top of that table. That's a lot, isn't it? You may guess, okay, with that much, if I were to put that many apple, 100,000 apple on top of my desk, my desk is going to break. That's true. Then why is not breaking then? It's because the pressure acts from all direction. So it's acting from the top. It's also acting from the bottom of the table. So because of that, they kind of balance. And because of that, what happens? You don't see that that amount of force. But for example, let's say water bottle, those flimsy water bottles, right? Once you drink water, uh, the water bottle is still in shape, but if you were to suck air out of that, what happens? It collapses. So why? Because now the pressure from inside is gone because you suck the, I wouldn't say all gone, but now it became lower because you sucked some of the air out from inside the bottle. So because of that, now outside air, they have now larger pressure than from inside. And because of that, that water bottle collapsed. Okay? It's the balance of pressure. Our body has a body fluid that provides pressure. And because of that, we survive. Otherwise, if the body fluid were gone, then what would happen? This atmospheric pressure is going to, you know, crunch our body. Not the rib cage, not the bone, but, ooh, maybe something like that, okay? If fluid from my, let's say, blood and so on, from my face gone, then my face may look like mm, something like that, okay? Uh, so 
anyway, so all this means we are inside the tremendous pressure, but since it acts from all direction, basically, you know, it's balancing and even inside our body, we have fluid and that is helping us to keep, you know, helping us to survive from that tremendous amount of atmospheric pressure, but it's everywhere there. So when we say, okay, there is 15 PSI, in this room, uh, that means we don't say, okay, what wall of this room, right? Similarly, when there is certain amount of pressure in the tire, that means it's everywhere, that pressure inside that tire. And at this point, I guess I wanna talk one more thing here. So when we say tire has, let's say 35 PSI, that is on top of this atmospheric all pressure already. So if even when the tire is totally flat, the atmosphere is there. So that means this 15 PSI is still there. So any air you add on top of atmospheric pressure is the pressure read by your gauge, pressure gauge, okay? So that's why this is also called gauge pressure. But how much is total pressure then? This also called absolute pressure. That is this plus this one atmospheric pressure. Okay, so the total pressure is that because that thing is always there. Okay, so that's about, uh, you know, pressure. So now I have a question for you related to pressure, area, force, and volume, or not volume, but pressure, force, any area, that definition we had, okay? So it says there is that much pressure, okay? So now, is there pressure difference between this window and that window? Looks like side length is double for this. So I'll let you work on this and you have a minute and 30 seconds. Thirty more seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four, three two, one, and it stops. Okay, let's see how did we do here. So we have all of these, but B and C getting a little bit more twice or four times, right? So here it says the pressure inside space station, so pressure is given inside this space station, and you are asked to find pressure in one window versus another window, larger versus smaller window. So when we say, okay, atmospheric pressure is this much, we don't say atmospheric, atmospheric pressure on the wall is this much, and atmospheric pressure on the another wall is this much, okay? They are same everywhere. 
So when you are trying to calculate two times or four times, what you are calculating is force. The force is pressure times area. Okay? So now difference in area gives the different force. But pressure, it says, the question says pressure is this much. So that means pressure is same on both windows. So that's the difference between force and pressure. So it could be confusing sometimes. I'm glad I brought this question here. A lot of you kind of got confused here. So pressure is given and you are asked to find pressure. So you don't need to multiply by force, sorry, area. But if you are asked to find force, then you need to multiply by area. If force was given, then you would divide by area. But here, the pressure is given and you are asked to find the pressure, okay? So that means pressure around us does not change much unless the height changes a lot, okay? Uh, and how change in height changes the pressure, we'll talk about that soon as well. Okay, with that, let's talk about Pascal's principle. Remember the unit of pressure is Pascal under this person's name who discovered this principle. So we usually brush our teeth, right? Sometimes we may forget, uh, but uh, for that, we need to squeeze the tube to get the toothpaste out of that tube. But we don't have to always push or let's say press right there near the hole, right? we can press anywhere as long as there is some reasonable amount of toothpaste inside the tube. So why that's possible? So that idea was, was discovered by Pascal and that's what we call Pascal's principle. And according to that, it says a change in pressure at any point in confined fluid. So that means like, you know, it is confined within this tube, right? Change in pressure is same everywhere. So you are changing pressure somewhere here, but change in pressure arrives over here as well. And that change in pressure is pushing this thing out, right? And uh, there is this device uh, set up. I brought picture off and it shows the systematic way of demonstrating it. So there is a round flask uh, you know, glass, I guess, glass flask, yes, uh, with a lot of holes. And you fill that with water and it is connected to a piston and cylinder system here, right? So by pushing this piston in, you can, you are applying force over that area means you are increasing pressure, you are changing pressure. So when you change pressure, what happens? Water starts coming out from in all direction from all these holes with about the same speed. So what that means they are getting pushed by same amount of pressure. Where is that coming from? It's coming from this change over here. So change was change in pressure was here, but that change in pressure affecting water inside this flask. So that's what it means. Another simple you know, image I found was this. So for example, let's say you have some reading here, all of them somehow showing the same reading and you squeeze this. So that means you change the pressure because you applied force over that area. And what happens? Change in the reading gonna be same for all of these, assuming this is not that deep, okay? Yes, pressure changes with height as well. Uh, but here, uh, this container is that not that tall. So because of that, change in pressure is going to be same. So that's what the Pascal's principle. So this, this property of fluid has some advantage and disadvantage as well. So for example, uh, talking about disadvantage, here is a picture where I'm showing the how the glaucoma kind of, you know, condition occurs in our eye, eyeballs. So that basically blurs our vision, okay? 
So to keep our eye moist, what happens? There is this mechanism where there is this fluid is coming out. So there is source of fluid and there is sink of the fluid because once it circulates here, it has to get out. So when it's perfectly working, source and sink, both of them are working great. But if source stops working, that's when you need to <laughs> apply the you know outer fluid. But in this case, this glaucoma, this condition occurs because the sink gets clogged. Okay. So then what happens? There are going to be extra fluid. And here is this full view of our eyeball. So what happens then? Once the fluid amount increases here, force increases because of that weight and pressure increases. And that pressure gets transmitted to this fluid that is inside this eyeball. And there is at the back of this eyeball, there is this thing called a retina. That's like a screen. That's what makes the image. And that's what our brain nerves read that image. And that's how we see the objects. So what happens is because of that pressure, it's like there is projectile screen and there are, you know, a lot of kids pushing on the screen now and distorting the shape of the screen. What happens now? Image gets distorted, becomes blurry. So this condition is called a glaucoma. Okay. So it is caused by this property that change in pressure here in the front of the eyeball also gets transmitted to the back, equally get transmitted to the back. And because of that, we get this blurry vision. Okay. So that is bad thing about uh, this, uh, you know, change in pressure transfer. But there are several devices we have devised to uh, make our life easier. So for example, hydraulic lifts and brakes. So first let's talk about lifts, okay? So what happens is like if we were to lift a truck, for example, like this car or truck, one person cannot do it, of course, two person cannot do it either. So it needs several persons. So there are these hydraulic lift designs. So how it works? So one side, the area is smaller. Other side, this area is bigger. Okay. So you apply force on the smaller side. So what is change in pressure then? Because of this force you applied, let's say the force you applied is F1 and the area over there is A1. So that means change in pressure on that side is this much. And since we know about Pascal's principle, we know this change in pressure gonna go and that gonna be same here on this larger area as well. And let's say the force over there is F2 and area is A2. And according to this Pascal's principle, these two must be equal. So now how much force is acting here? And definitely bigger. And by how much? So for to, to figure that out, we can rearrange that equation, solve for let's say this force here, F2, okay? Force over here. So that force, the new force depends on of course the force you are applying on this side, but mainly it depends on the ratio of this area. So by whatever fraction or factor, I should say, the A2 is bigger compared to A1, the force multiply gets multiplied by the same amount. So for example, let's say, area over here is two and area over here is eight, then this is four times larger. See, the eight divided by two is four. So it increases by a factor of four, okay? So sometimes, so basically that's what I'm trying to uh, show you how this mechanism works over there. I talked about it, it's also written on the slide. 
So before I go to the break here, sometimes these areas, rather than giving you area, you may be given the radius, okay? Any circular object, you may be given radius. For example, let's say for that one, that, another one, radius is R2, let's say. So in that case, you need to replace area by the radius. So how the area and radius are related? Pi R squared. So area on the side one, this side is pi R1 squared. And area on this side is pi R2 squared. So now if the area, rather than area, if it is radius given, then now what happens? Area is now radius square dependent. So if R2 or when R2 is two times R1, then R2 square is gonna be four times R1 square. So area gonna be four times when radius simply doubling. So when area becomes four times larger, the force also becomes four times larger, although the radius is just doubled. And area and radius, it has a square. So we need to take account of that, okay? So sometimes you may be given in terms of radius and what happened to the pi, if you think, okay? I already ate that pi, so we don't have to worry about it. What I mean is, since this area, they are in ratio, anything that's constant that's not changing, they just cancel, so we don't have to worry too much about it, right? So that is, for the radius and diameter, same thing, uh, you know, diameter, radius is half of diameter, so if we do half diameter and you square it, it becomes four, on the bottom and d square over there. So four not gonna be changing, pi not gonna be changing, only d is changing. So basically how it changes is gonna be same as how the radius changes, okay? So same idea. Any extra constant, they're gonna cancel when you find this ratio. Now about the breaks. So, we do the oil change in car, but uh, once in a while, after several years, you may also be recommended to, you will be asked to, hey, it's time for brake fluid change. And if there is leak, of course, uh, that's gonna go away. So you have to change. Maybe you may also get in the accident. So what's the fluid brake plays the role? Okay, brake fluid plays the role. So here, when we are hitting the brake pedal, we are applying force. So it is eventually connected to this piston and there is a cylinder and cylinder has a fluid, brake fluid, okay? So what happens by applying force, you are changing pressure over here and that change in pressure gets transmitted everywhere, see? In all four wheels, that same amount of change in pressure goes. And that pressure, you can multiply that change in pressure by area to get the change in force or extra force you are getting. So that force acts on this brake, okay? So there are brake pad and clip. So I think that's the area at which that pressure is changing. So you need to multiply by that area. So that's how this, you know, fluid is handy, okay? In the past, there used to be just a wire that's connecting everywhere, and then you use that. I think if you have handbrake, uh, that also has wire, but that's not that reliable. Sometimes, who knows, a rat may go there and cut the wire then your brake is gone, right? But that's not the case with the, so mechanical failure is very small with the fluid as long as fluid is there, okay? So that's why these days all these brakes are hydraulic brakes, okay? 
Now, we are still talking about pressure. So just like I was saying, if you go really high, for example, when we say, okay, what's the atmospheric pressure? We gave a value around 100,000 Newton over a square meter or 100,000 Pascal. And that is near the sea level. Here we are at mile high. So at this height, what happens? Pressure are gonna be different. We know that. And how much then? What's the actual pressure here? Uh, if it's not exactly one atmospheric pressure that we've been, uh, you know, told. How do we calculate that? So for that, we need a formula that gives us pressure at two different points with change in height. So where is pressure higher? Near the bottom of the layer, okay? And here, this video shows this uh, demonstration. And this is from a YouTube site called Physics Demo. Physics Demos, I think, Physics Demos, okay? That's the name of the YouTube channel. There are several demos over there, I like it. So now there is this tall glass jar, should I say jar? Uh, so over here, you see there are three openings at different heights. So right now water is all the way there. I don't know if you can see it, depending on what device you are looking at, okay? Now, once we unplug these holes, what happens? The water is gonna start flowing. And here you can see, what you wanna see is, which stream of the water, you know, lands farthest. Farthest it lands means it starts with larger speed. And why does it start with larger speed? Because it's getting pushed by larger force. Means it's ex it has larger pressure over there, okay? So farther it lands, larger the pressure we can tell. Let's watch. So as you can see, now I stop the video. So you see the highest one over there, it's landing closer and the middle one going there and the lowest one is going the farthest. You see that? So that means lowest pressure here and pressure is higher and highest over here among these three openings. We can see that, right? So now what we need to do is we need to write an equation for that. Okay. Okay, so we have five minutes until 11. So maybe it's a good idea to take a break at this point uh, because uh, this derivation may take a little bit more than five minutes. So let's take a break and I'll see you in five minutes. Okay, folks, welcome back. So before break, uh, I said, okay, we're gonna write the equation that gives us the pressure difference between two points. Here, I'm assuming there is a cylindrical container and it does not have to be cylindrical, okay? It can be any shape. So it can be in the ocean, okay? Any kind of lake, ocean, everywhere, anywhere, does not matter, but here for convenience, I made a cylindrical object where there is fluid and I am using a part of fluid. So for example, if it is it was inside the ocean, you can still imagine taking a cylindrical shape, a portion, a column of fluid from there or water from there, okay? So that's what this dashed cylinder means here, okay? So now, this is a point, this is another point, and this is the depth between these two points, okay? So pressure at this point, you know, upper side, it acts from the up, so that means force over here gonna be this pressure here times the 
area, this upper part of the area. So that's what we are interested in to keep things simple. We are just looking at one column of water, okay? It's there on the ocean. We are just isolating our, in our head. Okay, let's look at the cylindrical column of water and see what's happening rather than looking at whole ocean, okay? So now, the force at, in this area can be written as this because pressure is force over area, means force is pressure times area. So for this one, it's gonna be force over there, gonna be pressure and area. And similarly over here, it's gonna be pressure over there times area. And remember, pressure acts from all reduction. So when we are looking at the bottom of the cylinder, that means we are interested in the pressure or the force that's acting up, okay? So now we want to relate pressure here and pressure over there, and they are related. You know, we can, if we write in terms of forces and draw a free body diagram, we can write the equation using, you know, equilibrium condition, Newton's first law, because fluid is not flowing there, they are in equilibrium. The molecule of the water may be a little bit oscillating here and there, but overall fluid is not flowing. So that means fluid over overall is at equilibrium. So we can draw a free body diagram and apply the equilibrium condition. And that's what I'm doing. So pressure from the bottom is acting up. So that's why I'm showing it up there. And of course, this dot means I am replacing this water column by that dot, okay? And the force due to this pressure P1 is pointing down, and that's what I'm doing here. And there is one more force, that is the weight of the object, okay? So weight of this water column. So let's say that is Mg, okay? So there are three forces. So now we can use the equilibrium condition. So assuming this up as a positive y, I can say, okay, net force in vertical reduction is equal to zero because it's not accelerating. It is not in equilibrium. The water column is not accelerating. So out of these three forces, one is pointing up. So that's why I'm writing this as a positive and two of them are pointing down. So that's why I'm writing them negative. So we want to find the relationship between P2 and P1. So let's move this M1, Mg on this side, becomes positive. And then there is A, there is A, let's factor that out, okay? So when we do that, what happens? That factored A, when moved to the other side, goes bottom here, okay? Mg was negative, it became positive. So now you see this is change in pressure. Pressure at the bottom, pressure at the top. So when we are finding that, that is change in pressure. So change in pressure depends on the weight of this fluid column divided by the area. So see, we are looking at the imaginary fluid column. So if we go measure the area, not gonna be fun. So can we get rid of area? So for that, we're gonna take, so again, and finding mass is also not that great, you know, uh, so not gonna be easy. So we're gonna make use of this knowledge we just learned that density is mass over volume. So I can replace mass by density times volume, great. Density, if we know what fluid it is, for example, if it is water, density of water is 1000 kilogram per cubic meter, we can tell that, okay? Now we need volume, okay? So there is area, there is volume. And volume and area, for example, they are related. So we can make use of that. So let's do that. So volume, so here we took cylindrical shape so that the volume of the cylinder is this area times this depth. Okay, so I can make use of that. Area times depth is volume, right? And I'm just copying these. 
So these two things are constant, so we don't have to worry about it. So by writing this, what did we do? We eliminated the area. We don't have volume anymore. So we don't have to go measure the area of the object. So it becomes area independent. So that means does not matter what shape of the object is, it does not matter, okay? Pressure difference simply depends on the depth, okay? Simply depends on the depth. Remember the fluid, once we, you know, fix the fluid, density is constant, right? So yes, it's gonna be different for air versus for the water density, right? But once we fix the fluid, for example, if we are looking at pressure difference underneath water or on the air column, that means we fix that fluid, means density is fixed, G, of course, fixed. So it simply depends on D that way. And that's what I'm writing. So we can rearrange this. So bring P1 on this side. So this is a relationship that gives us the pressure at two different points. Pressure at upper point and pressure at lower point. And you see the pressure at lower point is larger than pressure at point one by this much. Since rho or the density and G are constant, so the pressure change is directly proportional to the depth. You go double the depth, pressure gonna double. So here there is no square or anything like that, okay? Simple equation, okay? And uh, I have done a problem where, you know, the, there is pressure calculation with the depth. So it is just plug in chug problem. So I'll let you just look at that, okay? I did not bring it here. Uh, so it is in the note, but, I like to ask you this question. So here, see this is closed, this is open. Yeah, excuse my drawing. I did not, you know, I spent too much time drawing this. So this is open. So do you, you are pouring fluid here. And when it starts filling, what happens? They start rising here. They rise because they are under the atmospheric pressure one atmospheric pressure, right? So now the question is, how the depth or the height, okay? So for example, for this one, if it goes up to that, so that's gonna be D1 and so on, okay? So for two, D2, for this one, D3, okay? How are they related? So that's the question. So I'll let you answer that based and answer that based on the knowledge we learn okay about the relationship between pressure and depth and i think uh, our minutes should be good enough for this Thirty more seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four. Three, two, one, and it stops. Oops, there. So let's see what we got. So we are getting all, no A, but all of them, mostly C, and that seems to be correct. Because it's one atmospheric pressure, means it's a change in pressure, or pressure directly related to the depth or height. So that's why they're gonna be same because pressure is same. So 
Yeah, it's kind of hard to believe. So that's why I searched for an image so that I can show you. You know, in the setup, you see all of them are labeled. So that's why we say, okay, water label, you know, no matter uh, what it is, water levels up, right? Deep place, not so deep place, in a lake, level of the water seems to be same everywhere. Okay, so that's that. And here is another question. So when we go and take blood pressure in doctor's office, usually they ask us to sit on a chair and then put a cough here, okay? That is near the, you know, heart, you know, at the level of the heart. But let's say a person is standing and then we are taking pressure at different places, okay? Will the pressure be same or different? If it is different, where is going to be highest or lowest? So that's this question is about. So I think uh, 30 seconds would be good enough for this. So 30 seconds, folks. And five more seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. Okay, let's see what we got. So mostly feet, and that is correct. So our body has like, uh, how many percent? Around 90%, I forgot the number, or 75%, I should, I think. 75% fluid. So it's like a cylinder of fluid, right? So greater the depth, greater the pressure. So if you go to the medical field and take pressure, don't take pressure from the feet unless the person or unless the patient is lying on the bed. If person is lying on the bed, then depth is not changing, right? So should we same everywhere, but if person is standing, and then basically you take the pressure near the heart level because heart plays the role of you know giving the pressure. We'll talk about that soon. But before that, I have one more question related to pressure and depth. So what do you think? You have a minute to answer this question. Thirty more seconds. And five more seconds. Five, four, three two, one, and it stops. Okay, let's see what we got here. So mostly B, better be correct. So let's take a look. So here it is, one is exposed to the atmospheric pressure. So there is one atmospheric pressure here. You go to the greater depth. So now you have higher pressure. So P2 is bigger than P1. How about P3? They are at same depth, okay? So we have to measure depth from where it is exposed to the atmosphere. So you do not wanna measure depth over here, okay? Now, so, so that means P2 and P3, they seems to be equal. 
So P1 is less than P2 and P2 and 3 are equal. So yes, B seems to be correct response. Great. Okay, so now this depth and pressure relationship can be used to make a pressure measuring device, pressure gauge, okay? And so one such pressure gauge is called barometer that measures the pressure of the atmosphere, okay? So just like I said, pressure changes uh, from one height to another height, but there are gonna be little change in pressure because of even the, you know, the atmosphere change, you know, like uh, weather change. So how do we make a pressure gauge? For example, here, there is long tube, you see. So you wanna take that long tube and fill that with the mercury. Why mercury, why not water? I'll talk about that a little later. Once it is full, then all the air from the tube is out, right? So now we can invert that and bring carefully, bring all the way to this container over here that you see on this picture and insert the tube while closing that. You do not wanna let the air inside. So once inside this container, you can remove your hand so that way air not gonna get there. So you will see what happens is this mercury coulomb stands. Why does it stand? Just like we saw in the previous, you know, question over here. Oops, that was far. See here what happens? These columns, they stand and they depend on pressure, simply pressure. So because of that atmospheric pressure, what happens? It is stands to a certain height. Let's say it is stands to a height H. So that's what I am saying here. So now over here, pressure is zero. We made zero pressure because we got rid of all the air. There may be a little amount of mercury vapor, uh, but that pressure, let's say, is negligible. So we can say, okay, pressure at the top is zero. So we can set that as a zero. And now pressure at the bottom here is coming from the atmospheric pressure. So that's the atmospheric pressure, basically. So we can rewrite that equation something like this. So pressure here at the bottom is atmospheric pressure. P1 became zero. So, so that means the atmospheric pressure simply depends on height for this setup here, okay? Here, rho is density of mercury because we are putting mercury fluid here and we know Z. Okay, now let's say how high it stands. Let's try to figure out how high, sorry, how high it stands, right? So for that, I'm solving this for H. So bring this to the side of the atmosphere pressure. So that's that. So now let's plug in the numbers because let's say if we put something in one atmospheric pressure, how high it's gonna stand, how tall it's gonna stand. If we wanna find that, we can plug in the numbers that we know, okay? So these are the numbers. That's atmospheric pressure in the SI unit. And this is the density of mercury. I wrote times that. So that is basically same as this, okay? But 10,600 kilogram per cubic meter. So if we move these three decimal places here, it becomes three. So I did that for region, otherwise it's written 1.3. So that way it would be four. But I'm writing that because I wanna use the 10 to the power three here later. So anyway, when we solve that, we get about three quarter of a meter. That's how high it's going to stand tall. So in terms of millimeter, since there are thousand millimeter in a meter, we can write something like that. Okay. So now, if we were to put water over here, how tall it's gonna stand? So for that, water has just density thousand. So that means we get rid of this 13.6. So water gonna stand 13.6 times taller than mercury. So mercury is standing near 
three quarter of a meter. So water gonna stand 13.6 times that. So I don't know, that's gonna be around 10 meters looks like, 10 meter tall. And 10 meter, how tall is that? Probably you have no idea. I have a meter scale and that tells me it is three feet, okay? So one meter is three feet. So 10 meter is 30 feet, 30 feet tall. So if you make this barometer, it's not gonna fit in a room because our ceilings, they are around nine or 10. So that means we need three story building. So that's why, although the mercury is kind of poisonous, uh, you know, these uh, mercury barom the barometers are made up of mercury so that you can get rid of, you know, you can have just a, a meter tall or less than a meter tall tube. Otherwise you need 30 feet tall tube if you were to make this, you, this barometer out of water, okay? So now, see here, we are measuring height, this millimeter, and this height is the height of the mercury. So we have to be more specific. If we were to put water, that height is going to be different. So it depends on what kind of fluid we are putting in the barometer tube. Okay, so that's why millimeter mercury. So are you, are you? Does that remind you anything about uh, this unit? Like uh, uh, anything you measure in this unit? Millimeter of mercury. Mm hg. So when we measure our blood pressure, basically that's the unit they give us blood pressure, but that is actually not a blood pressure. That means it is the height of the mercury they are giving, okay? It's simple to measure and simple to express. And since pressure and height, they are proportional. Taller height means larger pressure, right? So that's why, that's how it is used for convenience. But if you wanna find pressure, what you need to do? To that height, you need to multiply that by G and also multiply that by the density of the mercury. And that's gonna be the actual pressure, okay? That MMHG is not pressure, that is height, okay? So, and what happens is, uh, we, if you like, you can convert that into inches, which is nearly 30 inches, okay? So that is one atmospheric pressure. So why I brought this in inches? Because when I watch, you know, local news, some often they give the weather thingy, and when about weather is about to change, they talk about, you know, the weather pattern and so on. And sometimes they also display the atmospheric pressure at different region and say, okay, in our region, pressure is coming down, decreasing, and because of that our weather gonna be a bit stormy, okay? That's what they say. So when they display a number, they display that in inches, okay? So that's why I just brought it here. So what happens? The air molecules moves from high pressure region to low pressure region. So if in our region, pressure starts dipping down, gets smaller, what happens? Then the storm, hits our area. So that's how the just monitoring pressure can tell about what's going to happen to the weather. Okay. And of course, our blood pressure. So what are we measuring? So there is fluid, that's blood, that's exerting pressure in our arteries and vein. That's what we are measuring, right? So for that, we use this device. See, there is that. There is this some sort of fluid column, okay, mercury column. So that reading is above the atmospheric pressure. So that's why this reading is not that large. So this is, you know, gauge pressure. It is not absolute pressure. So if you are in, you know, some sort of medical field, uh, have taken, let's say, pressure on your own in your home with this kind of cough and the stethoscope. 
Uh, you may have noticed you hear for two sounds, right? While measuring, but these days you may have just the digital thingy that displays convenient, right? But in this process, you hear for two large bit, hard bits, okay? So you put large pressure on the cough, larger than usual human pressure, body, you know, blood pressure, and then slowly release it, and you listen. And when blood pressure of our body matches with the pressure on the cough, that's when you hear the large, lo loud bit, heart bit, okay? That phenomenon is called resonance. At the end of this semester, we'll talk about a resonance, okay? So that means when these two numbers match, what happens? It resonates with louder sound. So that's what we are listening. And we are listening for two such sounds. And that's why we have two blood pressure measure, right? So for, let's say for normal, we assume, okay, it is about 80 millimeter mercury between 80 and 120, right? So one has a higher, another one is lower. It's because the pressure on the blood, see, blood get pushed on the, uh, you know, our arteries and veins because of the, the these bloods are circulating because the heart is uh, pumping that blood. And why heart is doing that? Uh, maybe when we are, you know, that, that is also the, the diaphragm may also be pushing the heart. But anyway, so when heart gets squeezed, the pressure is high. That's the highest pressure. And when heart is relaxed, when the, uh, the blood is coming back to the heart, then that's when the pressure is lowest. And so that's the pressure we are measuring. And they have their own name, systolic versus diastolic pressure okay so that's about pressure folks so now let's use this idea of pressure difference and come up with something what called archimedes principle so so discovery of this principle has kind of you know nice story probably you may hear this word eureka or phrase i should say eureka moment so I think the origin of that phrase comes from this, you know, discovery of this Archimedes principle. If you like to know about the story behind this discovery, uh, you know, search for this Eureka moment, Archimedes, okay? And you'll hear the uh, story. So he was in the bathtub thinking about his job and job was really intense because he used to work for the king. And king had given this task of finding the purity of gold in the crown, okay? Without doing any kind of chemical analysis, without scratching the, scratching the uh, crown. So that was the problem. And on those days, remember kings, if they don't like people, if people did not do the work, they may just kill the person, okay, right there. So that's how the threatening, uh, you know, the situation this person was. So he, he was thinking about this all the time, also on the bathtub. So he felt, okay, I feel a little lighter here on the bathtub than when I sleep on the bed. What's going on? What is this fluid doing? If I'm feeling lighter, how much? So he started thinking about it. He comes with this idea of this buoyant force and then... He gets out of the bathtub and runs on the street saying, Eureka, 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 means I found it, I found it, or something like that. And turns out at that time, he was so excited, he didn't even put towel, okay? When getting out of the bathtub, he was running naked on the street. So that's how the story goes. I'm not a very good storyteller. So if you read the story and tell yourself to somebody else, maybe you will make it even more interesting. So anyway, so that's the story. Anyway, I told it. So now let's write the equation for the buoyant force. So when we put something in the water, we feel it gets lighter. For example, lifting someone from inside the swimming pool 
is easier, but lifting the same person on the air is not that easy. So we are getting help from the water fluid, okay? So how much help we get, and it depends on what. So that's the thing we are actually deriving, and it's not that difficult, so that's why I'm going through the derivation, okay? Here, simple derivation. Physics is about derivation. A lot of discovery is done just by doing derivation. That's the duty of beauty of physics, okay? Later, they do the experiment to verify, indeed, the person who did the derivation did not make any mathematical mistake or so on. But large portion theoretical physics is about putting together the idea we already know using mathematics and then coming with the new thing that actually is true, correct, okay? So that's the beauty of physics. That's what I like about physics, okay? So here is simple derivation that doesn't need a lot of mathematics. So we already know the free body diagram. Here in this, free, this is not exactly a free body diagram. Here we not including mg here, okay? Here we are just interested in how much net force this fluid is applying on the object. So if downward force over here is F1 and upward force is F2, then net force gonna be just the difference between that and that's what we call buoyant force. And I'm showing it here. So buoyant force always acts upward. When does the buoyant force arises? When something is in a fluid. So we are always under the sea, you know, inside the sea of air. But density of air is so small, you know, and the buoyancy, buoyant force is not that much, okay? But if we go in the water, it becomes not so negligible, so how much? So that's what we are writing. So for that, buoyant force is the net force, means difference between these two forces. So let's write that down, okay? And let's write that in terms of pressure. Pressure at times area at that point here is F2, and same thing F1, right? So A is the area, so I'm factoring that out. So now I have this pressure difference. And we already found the equation for pressure difference, right? How the pressure changes with the depth. That's what we want to write. And that's what that is. In our equation, we had D. And we had no subscript here. But now we do. Why? Because before, when we are deriving this equation for the pressure difference, there was no any object. We are just looking at imaginary water column. But now we are actually putting another object in the fluid. So we have fluid and we have object. So two things. So two things usually has two different densities. So we need to differentiate that. So to differentiate from density of object to the density of fluid, we are writing this subscript. This subscript here, F means fluid, okay? So that's the fluid density. And uh, that comes from that equation we derived in the last you know, slide where we found the pressure difference. And here I'm writing H and could be depth. That's fine too. And both height and depth, they are just length, okay? Doesn't matter. All we have to do is we need to understand what it means, right? So over here, that's the height of the object, let's say, okay? So once we plug this for this, we have this thing times area. So let's write it down. So now we have height or depth times area. So that is the volume of the cylinder. We already used that before as well. So now I said that was volume of cylinder. But this may or may not be true. When cylinder is totally inside, it is fully submerged, then the volume of cylinder, yes. Otherwise, it's the volume of fluid displaced. So that's why you see here I'm writing VF. Why? 
we are talking about well, fluid here. So if we have something floating partially, let's say this much is outside, then if it is outside, this not you know this volume not going to count on the buoyant force. This volume that's outside does not contribute to the buoyant force. Only the part of the volume, fraction of the volume that's inside the liquid or fluid contributes to the buoyant force. So make sure you make the difference there. When they are different versus when they are same. When object is fully immersed, volume of fluid displaced is same as volume of object. Okay, and you can verify that by just, uh, you know, let's say you put water in, a, you know, a cup that is full all the way to the brim, brim, and then you put something, let's say a rock or something like that inside that, what's going to happen? The water is going to spill. So the object displaces the water. And we are talking about that volume of fluid displaced. And it turns out the volume displaced by the object is exactly equal to the volume of the object. If it is fully inside, it's going to be total volume. If it is partially inside, then only part of that object that's inside, that's going to, uh, you know, that, that volume is going to be equal to the volume of the fluid displaced. So volume of object and volume of fluid displaced, they could be different or same depending on situation. So pay attention to that. So now here there is product of volume and density. So that is also mass, right? Density is mass over volume, means mass is density times volume. That's what we learned today and used several times. So here we can also write that as something like this. So this is mass of fluid displaced times G means weight of the fluid displaced. So this is the this is called, you can write in terms of weight or you can write in terms of volume displaced. So both of these represents the Archimedes principle. So Archimedes principle tells us how to find buoyant force, okay? How much buoyant force is acting in an object that's inside or in a fluid, okay? So this is the equation for the buoyant force we're going to be using. But sometimes you may hear, okay, buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. That is also Archimedes principle. So now, what did we learn? So there is a net force called buoyant force when something is in the fluid. So now when we are solving problem using equilibrium condition, where object is in a fluid, then we need to include buoyant force in free body diagram, okay? And here is a question related to that. So there is this block of mass M, which is inside, fully inside water, and being suspended with a string, let's say. So there is tension on the string, and of course, there are gonna be weight of the block. Now the question is, is tension and weight, which one is bigger or they are same, okay? So this object is in fluid. So you wanna draw a free body diagram taking account of that one so that you can answer this correctly. So for that, I am giving you how much? A minute and 30 seconds for this. Thirty more seconds. Thirty 
and five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and it stops. Okay, so, oh, we have kind of bit of staircases here. She got a little bit more. So which one is there? So I don't know the answer. I need to draw a free body diagram. So that's why I ask you to do that too. I hope you did. So MG and tension. So that would be free body diagram if this was not inside a fluid, okay? But since it is on the fluid, there is one more force, buoyant force, okay? So now, what do you see? These, there are two forces that's acting upward and only one force that's acting downward. And since this is in equilibrium, they are balanced. These two are balancing just one. So the one must be bigger than one of those one because this is equal to sum of these two means one of these is gonna be smaller than mg. So we can just see from there and tell, okay, mg is bigger than tension. So yes, she is correct answer in this case. We can also write equation. For example, let's say this is positive y. Up is positive y. So we can write net force in y direction is zero. It is in equilibrium condition. So two forces are pointing up, tension and buoyant force. And buoyant force always points up, vertically up, okay? So zero. So let's solve for tension for fun. mg becomes positive, so that's why I'm writing it first. Yeah, v becomes negative. And you can see t and mg would be equal if the buoyant force wasn't there or if it was zero, right? But now, what's happening here? We are subtracting buoyant force from mg so that we are getting equal to tension. So it's like something like this. Eight is 10 minus two, right? <laughs> So 10 is definitely bigger than eight. So that's another way to look at it. But I have a question, something like this. So we can actually calculate tension or if we measure tension, we can even calculate the density of the object, right? So that's what the Archimedes did. He was able to find the density of the crown without, you know, just by inserting inside the water so he did not have to, you know, scratch or do anything with that. And that's how he survived. So a similar idea here. So it says if the cube is this much long, right? So length of the cube is given. L is 4.0 centimeter. So it has to be converted into meter. So to go from centimeters to meter, we need to divide by 100 or multiply by 10 to the power negative two. So this is a meter. And density is given in kilogram per cubic meter. So this is density of iron means density of object, okay? And density of, so since this is in the water, Density of water, we know, or you can look at the book, okay? So those things are known, and we are asked to find tension. So mass is not given, but we learn that mass is product of density times volume, and we use this several times. So that's what we're gonna use. Here, this mass is mass of the block, so that is our object. So I want to write that as a density of object times volume of the object. So that is mass, but G is still there. So I'm going to write that. And then next term is buoyant force. 
See, this object is fully inside. An equation for the buoyant force, if you look at the previous slide where we derived, it is density of fluid displaced, volume of the fluid displaced times G. Exactly like this, see the difference there. One for the fluid displaced, another for the object itself. So if you don't put subscript, then both of these are gonna be same and gonna be zero, right? That's not the case. So now, since the object is fully inside the water or submerged, what happens? Volume of fluid displaced is gonna be equal to volume of the object. And volume of the object, do we know how to find it? It's a cube, length is given, so that means it's gonna be L cubed, means 4.0 times 10 to the power negative two cubed and meter cubed. So four times four, 16 times four, 64. So this is like a 64 times 10 to the power minus six cubic meter. Uh, probably uh, you wanna do just that in calculator. So we know the volume and we know the density, we know the G. So that means we should be able to get the answer, right? So I will let you do this, okay? Uh, plug in numbers, all numbers are there and calculate. And I have also done very similar problem, only the dimension, they are different, okay? And here, rather than cube, we have a sphere. So a sphere has a density formula for the, I mean, volume of a sphere is given by this formula rather than L cubed, okay? So only that's the difference, otherwise everything is same. And you see the portion we were doing was this one here. So the equation we had was exactly same. And after that, I plug in numbers and get the answer. So it's done there. And it also has part C, where if uh, the string breaks, it's gonna accelerate. There are gonna be net force. And you can use, uh, that means dynamics, Newton's second law. So this problem shows you how do we use equilibrium condition and accelerated condition to solve problem, okay? So I want you to watch, look, do, and learn, okay? So that's all for today. And I'll see you guys another class. So if you have quick question, please stay behind and ask or else I'll see you next class.